Well, what a privilege to, to have all of you here this morning. And um, sorry that you couldn't be away for the long weekend. Someone had to stay, right? Ah, shucks. But it's, uh, we have the privilege of being in God's presence here together this morning. And I mean, where there's the gathering of the saints, that is always, always a good thing. Um, you're going to have to allow me this morning. I, I need a bit of, um, what do you call it? Artistic license, poetic license, whatever call you want to call it. Um, because I'm going to share this message, um, not, not necessarily in a bit of a traditional way. So, yeah, I trust that the Lord will minister to you as we, we do this. So in Genesis 1, Genesis 1, that's where everything started, right? That's where it began, where, where God came onto the scene and, and, and stuff just changed. And in, in Genesis 1 verse 26, he says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now listen, if, if God in that moment had anything, what it felt like to me when this young man was born and his brother and man, his chest was big when God said, let us make man. And God, we know that God desired relationship with us, that he made us in his image, that he created us for his pleasure. And this is the purpose which God did and why he started this journey. So you are the fruit of a loving God. Just let that sink in. You are God's son and God's daughter. And when Caleb says that, we know that it comes with certain privileges, but man, it also comes with accountability, and we need to walk this way. And, you know, you can ask him, I'm on his case every now and then, because I am dad, and I can. Okay, no, not that bad. <laughs> but my desire for him is only the best. But who of you know that the story kind of didn't just stay in the garden, didn't just stay nice, you know, with all the nice fruit and everything that was there in the rivers and, and you know, just walking with God. It was just absolutely awesome. You know, if that stayed that way, then I don't know if we would have been here. So thank you, Adam and Eve. And then something happened in Isaiah 14. We read the following verse 12 to 15. How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground. You laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. Above the stars of God, I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of uh, assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the high, heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. So Lucifer decides he wants to mess up everything, becomes prideful in his heart and stands up against God and God's God casts him out. Now, if you wanted to overthrow a kingdom, a very powerful kingdom, if you had this plan to destroy this kingdom, but you don't know how to do it, you will always live in this place where you want to destroy it, and you will always seek a way to break it down. And this is from the day what the devil wanted to do is to destroy God. He wanted to take God out. He wanted to be God. He wanted the throne. And he did everything. And then, if we read Scripture, we see that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, comes to earth. Now, can you imagine the devil going, He's seeing this opportunity. The son of the king has come to my world where I am in charge. 
where I can do stuff. And I'm sure he would have rejoiced. He would have gone, yes, my turf. I can take him out. I can do as I please. I can kill him. And then I can become God. Everybody will worship me. Right? Matthew 27, 33 says this. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gold. Sounds very nice. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink it. And when he laid, uh, when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them and by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. And I'm sure when we got to this point, that the devil thought he had it in the bag. Jesus, you know, if we think back before this event, for this moment in Scripture, there was him being beat. He was being uh, mocked. You know, he was spat on. He was falsely accused. You know, false witnesses were caused. to, And the devil pulled out all the stops to take out the Son of God. He had the plan. The plan was foolproof. He was executing it to the T. Everything was falling in his place. His, his, his agents were working very hard to make sure that by the end of this event, he would be God and he will sit on the throne. He was working very hard. And when we got here, I think he, he was going, man, all he has to do is die. All he has to do is just breathe his last breath and it's over. I've won. I'm done. When that happens, then the world is his to command. He can do it as please. I'm sure. I mean, he was already going, guys, prepare the tables. We're going to have a feast tonight. Said if be as we spit. Going to eat. Going to party. And then that moment came in Matthew 27, verse 50. He says, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And I can just see it. An eruption in hell. Everybody's going, yeah. Like, yes, it's done. It's finished. <laughs> We've won. We've killed God. So many people wish to do that, to say that God does not exist to this day. Many wish they can kill this God who does amazing stuff. I can just imagine in Israel's journey, uh, you know, the, the, the enemies as they faced them, and they had to deal with this God who was on their side, was so, you know, what, murluous, because everything they did stuff, God would just pitch. You know, and through the, 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 the millennia, the devil was out to destroy God. And here, finally, this moment comes. The Son of God breathes his last breath. It is done. But then. But then. And I'm sure he did not expect this. I'm sure... The whole party got to a standstill. In verse 51 of that same scripture, says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Can you imagine him going, Ha ha ha? What just happened? Who tore that thing? And he was trying to figure out who's the guy that now went to tear this thing. And, and he's like freaked out. And the earth shook, and he was going, And rocks were split. The tombs also were open. Now that. You know, even those guys, he thought he had them. 
And suddenly the tombs open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went, uh, went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, this life, this power, this moment where he thought, this is the victory, it's done. Suddenly, tubes open. The curtain is split. And trust me, he knew what that curtain meant. When it split there, it was like, whoops. Houston, we have a problem. He knew his plan had failed. He had lost a perfectly executed plan over millennia blew up in his face right there. In that moment, an absolute display of God's power, his love for man, that he even raises the dead in that moment to go tell those what, a, that it, what had just happened. Wow! Such a powerful moment to the devil's demise. <laughs> Life brought forth from the cross. The very thing that was the symbol of death and humiliation. So many people died on crosses, but this one went wrong for the devil. The cross, the moment of victory for us, became the biggest thorn in the flesh of the devil. I only imagine what he must think when everybody wears this cross around the neck and it reminds him of a moment where everything went south. It's a testimony that stands through the, through the ages going, devil, you lost. And that testimony will stand forever. Matthew 28, verse 2 to 6 says this, And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended. Now, okay, so it didn't stay at the cross. So we're here now. And he came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. He appeared, his appearance was like lightning. Oh, that must be amazing. And his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the gods trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. Wrong address. You came for nothing. For he has risen. And he said, come and see the place where he lay. Now as a powerful moment as the cross was, can you imagine the whole of hell in that moment where they thought, <laughs> at least he's in the grave, guys. We've got him there. We are good. And then Jesus' pinky twitched. Like, wait. Did you see that? No, I saw nothing. And then his, his hand does this. And, and, and then suddenly they realize, but wait a second. He's not dead anymore, but he is alive. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so glad I'm not the devil. <laughs> if we can only grasp the full impact of that moment, I guess we will live lives that looks different, that are rooted in an awesome, powerful moment in history, that we will find our, can I say, destiny or purpose or, um, what's the word I'm thinking of, uh, who we are in the fact that Jesus died on that cross. He paid 
the full price. And then he said, it is finished. And then he got out of that grave three days later. Now by that time, it must have been chaos in hell. New plans were being made to, 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 to destroy anybody that would receive Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And that is you and me who are sitting here today who recognize the cross. We just sang it that He is Lord. Of my life. And you became his new mission. But you. Are more than a conqueror. Through Christ. The cross. Has the final word. The cross. Will always have. The final word. The resurrection is something the devil would want to deny and has tried to through various people to get it, you know, stricken from the record. Yet we know that he is alive. The cross has the final word over your life. What does that mean to you? When the cross is the final word over your life. You know, that's why we baptize people. It's because they recognize and say, but I follow Jesus Christ who died on that cross and who was risen. I'm identifying with him. That is the word over my life. The death and resurrection of Jesus paid it all. It is finished. But I don't think we always live like it's finished. Sometimes we live like it still must be done. We make stupid decisions because we are not settled that it is finished. So this morning, allow me to cancel you with powerful words. It is finished. Put that on your coffee cup in the morning so that when you drink it, you are not speaking about the coffee, okay? <laughs> Although sometimes a coffee cup can be very quickly finished in any case, but it is finished. Put that on your car. Put that on your screen of your Windows welcome page. Maybe just to remind you that it is done. You are no longer a sinner, but a son. You are a child of the living God. That's what the cross is. You are no longer a slave. You are free. You are more than a conqueror through this act of Christ on this Friday. Many years ago. You are no longer a slave to sin. I guess the worst thing that we can say is I battle with something. Because it's a confession saying, but I'm a slave to that now. I guess maybe I should just identify with who I actually am, what the cross says, who I am, and be free. And I know it's not always that easy. But man, you need to get the confession in your mouth. You need to speak the truth that I am no longer a slave to sin. And when that temptation comes, you go, <laughs> wrong address, Poppy. Move on. This must be someone else's mail. Wrong address. I am no longer a slave to this thing you want to enslave me with. I am free. The cross declares the price is paid. You are forgiven. May we walk and live as people who know that. 
I am forgiven. I am forgiven. I am free. I'm not a slave. Devil, near. The cross, or the word of the cross is that the devil has lost and Christ has won. The death of one man on a cross, the, the single most powerful event that impacted the world then and still does. The blood of one man shed for many. The forgiveness of sin granted. Reconciliation with God guaranteed. Eternal life, a gift. May today and this weekend remind us of who we are in Christ. May we go through this weekend almost like a sanctification process by the blood and the presence of God over our lives so that when we get on to Monday, things look different because I am again reminded of who I actually am. I am a child of God, a son and a daughter. And that comes with certain privileges. That comes with backing. That comes with a God to whom nothing is impossible who stands behind you. Oh, and then he does this amazing thing where he leaves the Holy Spirit here to dwell in you, to teach you everything, to remind you of everything that he has said. You are not alone. You are not alone. You have the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. John 3 verse 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but either in order that the world might be saved through him. See, those that believe will not perish. And I know we always... Speak out, verse 16. But may we remember, verse 17. Because he echoes this again in Matthew. Go. God's heart is not to condemn the world. It sounds a bit weird now, Nandi. God not, did not send his son to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. Today, we celebrate God's love to the point where people get saved. The world gets saved. People can be reconciled with God. So the victory is not just for us. The cross is not just for us. It is for those that we meet, that we walk with. What is your answer if you you'd wear a cross and people ask you? I doubt if they will ask you because it's so common these days. Maybe we should speak. It's, do you know why I'm, why I'm wearing this thing? Can I tell you? Use it as a conversation starter. I want us just to close our eyes. As we worshipped, I just saw this picture and I 
I want us just to just to see yourself in this picture. See yourself as that person. You are kneeling on the ground, and it's dark. <coughs> it's pitch dark, and you there's there's only but shadow. There's only a shadow on you. And then Jesus is coming to you and he's kneeling right in front of you. And he's, he's lifting up your chin. And at that point in darkness, maybe think of some circumstances that you find yourself in. Think, think, think of your sicknesses or maybe the last sickness that you experienced. Or maybe someone close to you. The sickness that they went through or at this point is going through think of someone that you know that you love that is lost that don't know Christ maybe you yourself feel far from God at this point distant from him it feel like that veil was never torn You feel there's no con con connection between you and God. And then Jesus is kneeling in front of you. And he's lifting up your chin. And he's looking you in the eyes. But his face is smiling with excitement. And he's taking you by the hands. And he's standing up with you. And he's saying to you, my child, it is finished. My child, I have paid for you. I have paid for that sin. I have paid so that you and your loved ones can be saved. I have paid by my body for your sickness. And then... I saw Jesus turned around and looked up to the Father. And then I saw that person and, and see yourself full of light as the light of Christ is shining upon you. And Jesus is looking to the Father saying it is finished. And the Father looks at you no shadow, no sin, no sickness, no worries or anxiety or fear. He's looking at you as a pure, clean, washed, clean person. And then I saw how Jesus is taking you by the hand and saying to you, I have done this for you. I am now sending you. I am now sending you. And then Jesus, I saw how Jesus went to the Father. And uh, but, but what was amazing is how that the light stays with us, stays with that person. And how that person is walking towards a dark, dark world and bringing the same light to, that, to, to them. There, there is really only one thing that we can still do, and that is to respond. And Paul is talking about this in Corinthians when he says that be careful when you when you when, when you use the wine and, and, and the bread in communion. Search your heart. As Kobus has said, to receive that what Jesus has done. Like we said, we often live in such a way that we, that Jesus has never came. And that is the judgment that we need to look in our own hearts for. Do we accept and receive what Jesus has done, what his blood has done for you? Do you understand what that means? What it means when, when his body was bruised, 
and the stripes on his back, on his, on, on his body, that paid for that sickness. Jesus, just before he, just before he <clears throat> um, went through this crucifixion, he, he said to his disciples, and he's saying to you this morning, as he's standing right in front of you, face to face, he's saying to you this morning, remember what I've done. Remember what I've done. I love you. I've paid for you. Everything is finished. And if everything was paid for and is done. So I want to just give a moment. And this is something that you need to, you need to search your own heart. Paul also explains it this way that, that every man needs to search his own heart. Do we accept, do we accept what Jesus has done for us? Do we live that way? Maybe it's, it's very specific. It becomes specific when we think of certain situations where we find ourselves in. Think of that circumstance that is burdening you, that is on your shoulder so heavy that you, that fear just comes over you. And then see how Jesus is, kneeling in front of you and lifting you up and saying, I've paid for that. I became the curse so that all the curse from your, from your life can be removed. <clears throat>